The next question we're going to ask is, RSA really a one-way function? In other words, is it really hard to invert RSA without knowing the trapdoor? So if an attacker wanted to invert the RSA function, well, what the attacker has is basically the public key, namely he has n and e, and now he's given x to the e, and his goal is to recover x. Okay? So the question really is, given x to the e modulo n, how hard is it to recover x? So what we're really asking is, how hard is it to compute eth roots modulo a composite? If this problem turns out to be hard, then RSA is in fact a one-way function. If this problem turns out to be easy, which of course we don't believe it's easy, uh, then RSA would actually be broken. So it turns out the best algorithm for this problem requires us to first factor the modulus n, and then once we factor the modulus, we've already seen last week that it's easy to compute the eth root modulo p, it's easy to compute the eth root modulo q, and then given both those eth roots, it's actually easy to combine them together using what's called the Chinese remainder theorem and actually uh, recover the eth root modulo n. So once we're able to factor the modulus, computing eth roots modulo n becomes easy, but factoring the modulus, as far as we know, is a very, very difficult problem. But a natural question is, is it true that in order to compute eth roots modulo n, we have to factor the modulus n? As far as we know, the best algorithm for computing eth roots modulo n requires factorization of n, but who knows, maybe there's a shortcut that allows us to compute eth roots modulo n without factoring the modulus. To show that that's not possible, we have to show a reduction. That is, we have to show that if I give you an efficient algorithm for computing eth roots modulo n, that efficient algorithm can be turned into a factoring algorithm. So this is called a reduction, namely given an algorithm for eth roots modulo n, we obtain a factoring algorithm, and that would show that one cannot compute eth roots modulo n faster than factoring the modulus. If we had such a result, it would show that actually breaking RSA, in fact, is as hard as factoring. But unfortunately, this is not really known at the moment. And in fact, this is the, one of the oldest problems in public key crypto. And so let me just give you a concrete example. Suppose I give you an algorithm that will compute cube roots modulo n. So for any x in Zn, the algorithm will compute the cube root of x modulo n. And my question is, can you show that using such an algorithm, you can factor uh, the modulus n? And even that's not known. What is known, I'll tell you, is, for example, that for e equals 2, that is, if I give you an algorithm for computing square roots modulo n, then, in fact, that does imply factoring the modulus. And so computing square roots is, in fact, as hard as factoring the modulus. Unfortunately, if you think back to the definition of RSA, that required that e times d be 1 modulo phi of n. And what that means is that uh, e necessarily needs to be relatively prime to phi of n. Right? This, what the first equation says is that e is invertible modulo phi of n. But if e is invertible modulo phi of n, necessarily that means that e must be relatively prime to phi of n. But phi of n, if you remember, that's equal to p minus 1 times q minus 1. And since p and q are both large primes, p minus 1 times q minus 1 is always even. And as a result, the GCD of 2 and phi of n is equal to 2, because phi of n is even. And therefore, the public exponent 2 is not relatively prime to phi of n, which means that even though we have a reduction from taking square roots to factoring, e equals 2 cannot be used as an RSA exponent. So really, the smallest RSA exponent that's legal is, in fact, e equals 3. But for e equals 3, the question of whether computing cube roots is as hard as factoring is an open problem. It's actually a lot of fun to think about this question. So I would encourage you to think about it just a little bit. That is, if I give you an efficient algorithm for computing cube roots modulo n, can you use that algorithm to actually factor the modulus n? I'll tell you that there is a little bit of evidence to say that a reduction like that actually doesn't exist, but it's very, very weak evidence. What this evidence says is basically if you give me a reduction of a very particular form, in other words, if your reduction is what's called algebraic, I'm not going to explain what that means here, uh, that is, if given a cube root or oracle, you could actually show me an algorithm that would then factor, that reduction by itself would actually imply a factoring algorithm. Okay, so that would say that if factoring is hard, a reduction actually doesn't exist. But as I say, this is very weak evidence, because who's to say that the reduction needs to be algebraic? Maybe there are some other types of reductions that uh, we haven't really considered. So I would encourage you to think a little bit about this question. It's actually quite interesting. Uh, how would you use a cube root algorithm to factor the modulus? But as I said, as far as we know, RSA is a one-way function. And in fact, uh, breaking RSA, computing eth roots, that is, actually requires factoring the modulus.
We all believe that's true, and that's the state of the art. But now there's been a lot of work on trying to improve the performance of RSA, either RSA encryption or improve the performance of RSA decryption. And it turns out there's been a, a number of false starts in this direction. And so I want to show you this wonderful example as a warning. And so this basically this is an example of how not to improve the performance of RSA. So you might think that if I wanted to speed up RSA decryption, remember decryption is done by raising the ciphertext to the power of D, and you remember that the exponentiation algorithm ran in linear time in the size of D, linear time and log of D. So you might think to yourself, well, if I wanted to speed up RSA decryption, why don't I just use a small D? I'll say, I'll say a decryption exponent that's on the order of 2 to the 128. So it's clearly big enough so that exhaustive search against D is not possible. But normally, the decryption exponent D would be as big as the modulus, say 2,000 bits. Uh, by using a D that's only 128 bits, I basically speed up RSA decryption by a factor of 20. Right? I went down from 2,000 bits to 100 bits. So exponentiation would run 20 times as fast. It turns out this is a terrible idea. Terrible, terrible idea. In the following sense, there's an attack by Michael Wiener that shows that, in fact, as soon as the private exponent D is less than the fourth root of the modulus, let's see, if, if the modulus is around 2048 bits, that means that if D is less than 2 to the 512, then RSA is completely, completely insecure. And this is, it's insecure in the worst possible way, namely, just given a public key and an E, you can very quickly recover the private key D. Well, so some folks said, well, this attack works up to 512 bits, so why don't we make the modulus say, you know, 530 bits? Then this attack actually wouldn't apply, but still we get to speed up RSA decryption by a factor of four because we shrunk the exponent from 2,000 bits to say 530 bits. Well, it turns out even that's not secure. In fact, there's an extension to Wiener's attack that's actually much more complicated that shows that if D is less than N to the 0.292, then also RSA is insecure. And in fact, the conjecture is that this is true up to n to the 0.5. So even if d is like n to the 0.4999, RSA should still be insecure, although this is an open problem. It's again a wonderful open problem. It's been open for like, you know, what is it, 14 years now, and no one can progress beyond this 0.292. Somehow, it seems kind of strange. Why would 0.292 be the right answer? And yet no one can go beyond 0.292. So just to be precise, when I say that RSA is insecure, what I mean is just given the, the public key N and E, your goal is to recover uh, the secret key D. If you're curious where 0.292 comes from, I'll tell you that what it is is basically 1 minus 1 over square root of 2. Now how could this possibly be the right answer to this problem? It's much more natural that the answer is uh, N to the 0.5, but this is still an open problem. Again, if you want to think about that, it's kind of a fun problem to work on. So the lesson in this is that one should not enforce any structure on D for improving the performance of RSA. And in fact, now there's a slew of results like this that show that basically uh, any kind of tricks like this to try and improve RSA's performance is going to end up in disaster. So this is not the right way to improve RSA's performance. Initially, I wasn't going to cover the details of Wiener's attack. But given the discussions in the class, I think some of you would enjoy seeing the details. All it involves is just some manipulating some inequalities. If you're not comfortable with that, feel free to skip over the slide, although I think many of you would actually enjoy seeing the details. So let me remind you, in Wiener's attack, basically, we're given the modulus and the RSA exponent N and E, and our goal is to recover D, the private exponent D, and all we know is that D is basically less than uh, fourth root of N. In fact, I'm going to assume that D is less than the fourth root of N divided by 3. This 3 doesn't really matter, but the dominating term here is that D is less than the fourth root of N. So let's see how to do it. So first of all, recall that because E and D are RSA public and private exponents, we know that E times D is 1 modulo phi of N. Well, what does that mean? That means that there exists some integer K such that E times D is equal to K times phi of N plus 1. Basically, that's what it means for E times D to be 1 modulo phi of N. It's basically some integer multiple of phi of N plus 1. So now let's stare at this equation a little bit. And in fact, this equation is the key equation in the attack. And what we're going to do is, first of all, divide both sides by d times phi of n. And in fact, I'm going to move this term here to the left. So after I divide by d times phi of n, what I get is that e divided by phi of n minus k divided by d is equal to 1 over d times phi of n. Okay.
So all I did is I just divided it by d times 5n, and I moved the k times 5n term to the left-hand side. Now, just for the heck of it, I'm going to add absolute values here. Those will become useful in just a minute, but of course, they don't change this equality at all. Now, 5n, of course, is almost n. 5n is very, very close to n, as we said earlier. And all I'm going to need then for this fraction is just to say that it's less than 1 over square root of n. It's actually much, much smaller than 1 over square root of n. It's actually on the order of 1 over n or even more than that. But uh, for our purposes, all we need is that this fraction is less than 1 over square root of n. Now let's stare at this fraction for just a minute. You realize that this fraction on the left here is a fraction that we don't actually know. We know e, but we don't know phi of n. And as a result, we don't know e over phi of n. But we have a good approximation to e over 5n. Namely, we know that 5n is very close to n. Therefore, e over 5n is very close to e over n. So we have a good approximation to this left-hand side fraction, namely e over n. What we really want is the right-hand side fraction, because once we get the right-hand side fractions, basically that's going to involve d, and then we'll be able to recover d. Okay? So let's see if we replace e over 5n by e over n. Let's see what kind of error we're going to get. So to analyze that, what we'll do is, first of all, remind ourselves that phi of n is basically n minus p minus q plus 1, which means that n minus phi of n is going to be less than p plus q. Actually, I should be precise. I should really write p plus q plus 1. But you know, who cares about this one? It's not, uh, it doesn't really affect anything. So I'm just going to ignore it for simplicity. Okay? So n minus phi of n is less than p plus q. Both p and q are roughly half the length of n. Uh, so, you know, they're kind of both on the order of square root of n. So basically, p plus q, we'll say, is less than 3 times square root of n. Okay, so we're going to use this inequality in just a minute. But now we're going to start using the fact that we know something about d, namely that d is small. So if we look at this inequality here, d is less than the fourth root of n divided by 3. It's actually fairly easy to see. If I square both sides and I just uh, manipulate things a little bit, it's difficult to see that this directly implies the following relation, basically 1 over 2d squared uh, minus 1 over square root of n uh, is greater than 3 over square root of n. As I said, this basically follows by squaring both sides, then taking the inverse of both sides, and then I guess multiplying one side by a half. Okay, So you can easily derive this relation, and we'll need this relation in just a minute. So now let's see. What we'd like to do is bound the difference of e over n and k over d. Well, what do we know? By the triangular inequality, we know that this is equal to the distance between e over n and e over phi n, plus the distance from e over phi n to k over d. Okay? This is just what's called a triangular inequality. This is just a property of absolute values. Now, this absolute value here, we already know how to bound. If you think about it, it's basically the bound that we've already derived. So we know that this absolute value here is basically less than 1 over square root of n. Now, what do we know about this? Uh, absolute value here. What is e over n minus e over 5n? Well, let's do common denominators and see what we get. So the common denominator is going to be n times 5n. And the numerator in this case is going to be e times uh, 5n minus n, which we know from this expression here is less than 3 times square root of n. So really what this numerator is going to be is e times 3 square root of n. The numerator is going to be less than e times 3 square root of n. So now I know that e is uh, less than 5n, so I know that e over 5n is less than 1. In other words, if I erase e and I erase 5n, I've only made the fraction larger. Okay? So this initial absolute value is now going to be smaller than 3 square root of n over n, which is simply 3 square root of n over n is simply uh, 3 over uh, square root of n. Okay? But what do we know about 3 over square root of n? We know that it's less than 1 over 2d squared minus 1 over square root of n. OK, so that's the end of our derivation. So now we know that the first absolute value is less than 1 over 2d squared minus square root of n. The second absolute value is less than 1 over square root of n. And therefore, their sum is less than 1 over 2d squared. And this is the expression that I want you to stare at. So here, let me circle it a little bit. So let me circle this part and this part. Now, so let's stare a little bit at this fraction here. And what we see is, first of all, as before, now we know the value of e over n. And what we'd like to find out is the value k over d. But what do we know about this fraction k over d? We know somehow 
that the difference of these two fractions is really small. It's less than 1 over 2 d squared. Now this turns out to happen very infrequently, that k over d approximate e over n so well that the difference between the two is less than the square of the denominator of k over d. It turns out that that can't happen very often. It turns out there are very few fractions of the form k over d that approximate another fraction so well that their difference is less than 1 over 2d squared. And in fact, the number of such fractions is going to be at most logarithmic in n. So now there's a continued fraction algorithm. It's a very famous fraction that basically what it will do is from uh, the fraction e over n, it will recover log n possible candidates for k over d. So we just try them all one by one until we find the correct k over d, and then we're done. We're done because we know that, well, e times d is 1 mod k, therefore d is relatively prime to k. So if we just represent k over d as a rational fraction, you know, numerator by denominator, the denominator must be d. And so we've just recovered, you know, we've tried all possible log n fractions that approximate e over n so well that the difference is less than 1 over 2 d squared. And then we just look at the denominator of all those fractions, and one of those denominators must be d. And then we're done. We've just recovered uh, the private key. So this is a pretty cute attack. And uh, it shows basically how uh, if the private exponent is small, smaller than the fourth root of n, then we can recover d completely and quite easily. OK, so I'll stop here.